we have a unique privilege as the people of God when we gather on a Sunday morning. Something special and something honestly weird is going on here. This is not normal. Um, and so we want to ask the Lord uh, to move among us and meet with us as we gather and as we worship. So let's take a moment to do that, and then I'll lead us in prayer. Father, would you do the work in us of giving us a laser-like focus on you? Um, I pray that you would give us a sensitivity to hear and receive your truth. I pray that your spirit would work in us to believe your truth. Um, As we open up the Bible, and as we read it, and as we sing it, and as it's preached, uh, I pray that you would move in us that you would move in us in power and in grace. Um, We want to be and do um, more of what you call us to be and do. So that means uh, work that gets done at the core of who we are, in what and who we love and what we think and believe and how we we trust. And that means a change in our our actions um, as we live out our identity in Jesus. And so I pray that you would do those things, and I pray that you'd be glorified as we behold your glory and remember and testify to your goodness together this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, I said something something weird happens on a Sunday morning when the people of God gather. And uh, one one of the things that's unique and amazing is that the Lord meets with us in a way that, uh, that we don't experience in other places. So the Lord is always with us. Uh, we don't suddenly experience the presence of God that we are not experiencing anywhere else, but the scripture is clear that, that uh, we do experience the presence of God in a different way and in a unique way and in a powerful way when we gather. And that's an incredible thing. Then I'm going to read a short psalm, Psalm 100, that's probably very familiar to you if you've been around the church at all. And that's going to call us to worship in the presence of God, entering his presence with praise and with thanksgiving as we reflect on how great he is and as we reflect on how good and kind and gracious he's been to us. And then we're going to sing about, uh, about those realities. We're going to sing in worship and we're going to sing in faith and in rest because of who our God is and what he's done. So let's stand as we're called to worship. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations.
God is not sparing Send him to die I scarce can take it in That on the cross My burden gladly bearing He let it die To take away my sin to confess our sin as we see our, uh, our shortcoming and our faithlessness and our weakness. Um, so let's confess sin together. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws we have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is nothing good in us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Restore those who are penitent according to your promises in Christ Jesus our Lord. Grant that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of his name. Amen. Now we're going to sing about the promise and hope of the gospel in light of our sin, because the things that we have prayed at the end of this prayer are true. The Lord will do those things in us and for us because of Jesus Christ, our good shepherd who has laid down his life for us. And so let's sing. Robbers and thieves encamp all about me. The thief comes to steal and to kill and destroy. Jesus the righteous will rise to defend me. The tyrant will flee at the sound of his voice. The Lord is my shepherd and I want for nothing. He stands behind me and he 
goes before and i will find pasture beside the still waters and i will find rest in his arms i trust in my good shepherd's heart The good shepherd who hung on the cross beat nails in his hands and nails in his feet. Why would the innocent die for the guilty? That's what the good shepherd does for his sheep. No one could take his life away from him. He lays it down on his own willingly. He took it all, then he rose on the third day. He gave me life, abundant and free. The Lord is my shepherd and I want for nothing. He stands behind me and he goes before. And I will find pasture beside the still waters. And I will find rest in His arms. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. And I want for nothing. And He stands behind me and He goes before. And I will find pasture beside the still waters. I will find rest in His arms as I trust in my Good Shepherd's heart. Man, let's thank Him for His goodness and kindness. And you can be seated. Let's pray together. Good morning, church. May you pray with me. Father, we come this morning offering ourselves to you in worship. Father, as we've worshiped this morning, I pray that our hearts, Lord, have been where they need to be. And Lord, we pray that everything that is done in this building today, Lord, our singing, our listening, our prayers, Lord, even our fellowship that we enjoy would be an act of worship to you. Lord, I pray that our lives would reflect a sacrifice of praise. Lord, that you would be lifted up as we lower ourselves in submission to your will and purpose for us. Father, as Pastor Matt has been preaching, Lord, the, the it... Lord, that we might be bringing into this building today, Lord, circumstances, Lord, broken relationships, Lord, things that are straining us, um, things that um, you've brought into our lives, Lord, Lord, whatever that it is, Father, that our faith and our hope would be, God, that it would be for our good, Lord, as you promise. Father, I pray that you'd guide our thoughts, that you'd keep us from distractions, Lord, you'd guard our hearts, knowing Lord, that um, our heads might be thinking right, but our heart may be far from you. Father, guide our words. Let us be encouragers, lifting each other up. Help us to resist the gossip and the rumors. Help us to speak truth and love. Father, give us boldness and courage for the week ahead to accomplish all that you want us to do. Father, I pray for another church in our area this morning. Lord, I pray for um, Boyd Bettis in the district church. I pray, Father, as they are on mission for you, Lord, that um, you would continue to bless them as they strive to preach the gospel and to live it. Lord, bless them this morning. I pray for Matt as he is um, prepared this week. God, give us the, the heart to listen. Lord, let us be ready and willing to accept and apply God, what he's bringing this morning. We thank you in your son's name. Amen. Good morning. Good to see all of you this morning. 
If you've got a Bible handy, grab it now, if you will, or uh, open up the app on your phone, whatever it is that you uh, need to do to get to the Bible. If you don't have an app on your phone or you don't have a Bible, there are Bibles in the chair racks around you or under you. And if you want to grab one of those thing, one of those Bibles, go ahead and do it. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 40 today. If you're not familiar with where to find things in the Bible, we have people with us each week who are not familiar with where to find things in the Bible, and so that's okay. Genesis is the very first book of the Bible, and so if you make, yourself, uh, your, make your way forward in the very first book of the Bible in Genesis, you will find chapter 40 fairly quickly. It took uh, 59 days to do it, 59 grueling, difficult days to do it, but Felicity Aston was determined to do it, and because she was determined to do it, because of that determination, she became the first woman to cross Antarctica solo. She was an experienced explorer. She had done all kinds of other explorations. Up to that point, she had led explorations in different places in the world up to that point. But this was going to be her greatest challenge. And the most difficult thing that she was going to face in this challenge of crossing Antarctica on her own was not what you might expect it to be. What are the things that would first spring to mind of some of the greatest difficulties that you might face if you were going to cross a barren wasteland like that on your own, which I have no intent or even desire to do? Well, it might be the cold. I've heard it's cold in Antarctica, so that could be a factor. It could be the fact that she was going to have to carry all the things necessary for that journey herself. It could be the fact that, that she may suffer from hypothermia, that she might develop some hypothermia and, and develop frostbite in some of her outer extremities before she even realized it. There are any number of things that could have happened to her that made this journey difficult. But one of the most difficult things she said about the journey was that she spent 59 days alone. She recounted that crying became part of her daily routine. And she said that it wasn't until 15 days into this 59-day journey that she went the first full day without crying. I would venture to say that none of us have ever attempted a solo journey across Antarctica. If you have, please raise your hand. No. Okay, we have one person, we have one liar in the back. <laughs> Now watch, that person actually has. <laughs> None of us have ever attempted a solo journey across Antarctica. But I suspect that most of us, at one point or another in our lives, have felt the profound sadness of being alone. It is a part of the human condition. It is an experience that all of us at one time or another face. We were not made to be alone. Even the most introverted among us need people around us. There are people here who have experienced this sense of being alone in, in rather extreme ways. And there are others of us who just feel like we are always lost in the crowd. 
But every one of us knows what it likes, knows what it's like to feel neglect, abandonment, or loneliness. We've been studying the life of Joseph together as we've been working our way through Genesis. And Joseph, at this point in his life, might as well have been in Antarctica. He had just recently had a big life change. He had had the experience of going from being a slave to an inmate. And yet there in prison, he is eventually put in charge of all the prisoners so that the keeper of the prison doesn't have to think about anything in the prison. He's delegated it all to Joseph. The last chapter told us that Potiphar, the person that he was enslaved by, had nothing to think about except what he was going to eat for dinner that night. And now we have, a, now we have the prison warden who is in a similar situation. Nothing to think about but dinner in the evening because Joseph is running the show. Joseph is succeeding in whatever it is that he does. But in chapter 40 that we're going to be looking at today, two people are going to enter this prison who are going to permanently alter the course of Joseph's life. Now, Joseph's life has been permanently altered on numerous occasions now. It has zigged and zagged as some of your lives may have done. Pharaoh, we find out, was angry with two individuals in his cabinet, his baker and his cupbearer. And there are uh, scholars of ancient times who, who recognize that even something like being a cupbearer may have been, in that context, something more like a prime minister. It was not just someone who carried Pharaoh's cup around in case he was thirsty at any moment. It was a person who likely had a significant advisory capacity in Pharaoh's life. But Pharaoh becomes angry with the baker and the cupbearer. The Bible does not tell us why they fall out of favor with him. And they are placed into the prison and thus placed into Joseph's custody. And one day, Joseph who's making his rounds around the prison, sees them and, find, and can tell immediately that there is something that is deeply troubling them. And so he inquires of them what the problem is. And this is what they tell him in verse 8 of Genesis chapter 40. You can look at verse 8 if you have your Bible open there. The Word of God says this, They said to him, We have had dreams, and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. Now, this might seem a little bit strange to us because, as I've mentioned before, we often don't take dreams seriously. You, we probably all had the experience of trying to run away from something or someone, and you can only run this fast in your dream, and you might spend all night running this fast trying to get away from it. But we don't take our we don't take our dreams seriously. Uh, several years ago, uh, we had we had somebody visiting our church, and we were having lunch with them afterwards. And I had just had a really strange dream the night before that I I thought was humorous. Uh, I was explaining over lunch that I had dreamed that Taylor Swift had asked me to go on tour with her as her chaplain. And I agreed. I delivered messages during the tour, and uh, that. And as I was, ex- I was explaining this this dream and how humor it was, humorous it was. The person sitting across from me said, "Well, you know, there may be something in that." And I, I looked at him, thought he was strange there for a moment, and here she is on tour right now. Still no invitation, but this is a person who came from a non-Western culture, which this is, and in the context of their times, they saw dreams as communicating information. 
And, and being an Egyptian, there was a, a whole group of people in Egypt who claimed to be able to practice divination to understand dreams. So these, these two men have had, they've both had a strange dream on the same night. We're going to see that there are some similarities in numerology inside of those dreams. And so when they wake up in the morning, their conclusion is that, of course, there would be some sort of meaning and significance to these dreams, and yet they are troubled because they are cut off from anyone who might be able to give them the interpretation, and so they explain it to God, or to, to Joseph. And when they've explained their dilemma to Joseph, notice that Joseph has an opportunity to put God in the forefront, because Joseph does not say, tell me the dream and I'll see if I can tell you what it means, thus making himself more valuable to them. He says, do not interpretations belong to God? Already questioning their worldview, he says, please tell them to me. So the cupbearer proceeds to tell Joseph his dream, beginning in verse 9. Look with me, if you will, at verse 9. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream there was a vine before me, and on the vine there were three branches. As soon as it budded, its blossoms shot forth, and the clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, This is its interpretation. The three branches are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office, and you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly when you were his cupbearer. Only remember me when it is well with you. And please, do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh, and so get me out of this house. For I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that they should put me into the pit. Now Joseph sees that perhaps God's hand is in this. Perhaps God is at work here providentially making a way for Joseph to be able to be released from prison. And so He asks a favor in return of the cupbearer because one good turn deserves another, right? He asks the cupbearer to remember his case, to remember that Joseph is actually an innocent sufferer. He does not deserve to be where he is. And I think it's interesting here, you may have noticed this when I read it, But he says there at the very end of verse 15, and here also I have done nothing that they should put me into the pit. That's the same Hebrew word used back in chapter 37 for the pit that his brothers threw him into when they decided whether they were going to leave him for dead in the pit or whether they were going to sell him and make profit uh, off of getting him off of their hands. What the author of Genesis is telling us here is that there is a sense in which Joseph has never been able to escape from that pit. That has set off a series of cascading consequences through his life that have run on for years now, which he has not been able to escape. Well, of course, this is great news for the cupbearer, assuming Joseph is not losing his mind and knows what he's talking about. Time will tell. So the baker steps up to the plate. He is excited that the cupbearer has received this good news about his dream, and so he wants to have his interpreted as well. Look with me then at verse 16. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was favorable, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream. There were three cake baskets on my head. 
And in the uppermost basket, there were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh. But the birds were eating it out of the basket on my head. And Joseph answered and said, this is its interpretation. The three baskets are three days. So far, so good. Verse 19, in three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head. So far, so good. From you. There's a plot twist. And hang you on a tree. And if that wasn't enough, and the birds will eat the flesh from you. So notice the, the play on words here of lifting up the head. In the cupbearer's dream, he has, been, he has been put down. He has been put down into this pit with Joseph. He has been put into prison where he, has, where he thinks he's going to be forgotten. But, but Pharaoh is going to lift up his head in a metaphoric sense. He is going to restore him so that the cup is back in his hand. He is, he is in, in, in Pharaoh's good graces. He is going to be able to act in his advisory role and will be able to continue as he once had. But the baker is going to have his head lifted up so that a noose can be slipped around it and he can be hanged and then eaten by birds from the tree. Start the timer. Click. Because this is supposed to happen in three days. Imagine what those three days were like for these two men, wondering, first of all, if Joseph has any idea of what he's talking about. The cupbearer is certainly hoping that he has found a guy who really can interpret dreams. The baker, hoping that this is a false alarm. Three days pass, and then look at verse 20. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, let me just say, I love how the Bible includes just random details. Pharaoh's got the cake. The candles are lit. Everybody's singing happy birthday. He's in a good mood. He's opening up his presents. It says he made a feast for all his servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker. Among his servants. So there we get that word play again with the lifting up the head. Both of their heads are lifted up, one for good and one for the end of his life. So, in his gratitude, the cupbearer sees that Joseph was correct, that he was lifted up. He had heard Joseph's story. He had listened to Joseph recount his case. And now, op operating in the position of power that he had, he immediately contacted the Egyptian wing of the Innocence Project to see if Joseph's case could be heard. Right? That is exactly what does not happen. Verse 23. Yet... The chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. As Pharaoh blows out the candles in his birthday cake, and the smoke from those candles kind of wisps up into the air, so any memory of Joseph wisps up into the air and floats away from the cupbearer's mind. Joseph doesn't know that. And you can imagine the first few days uh, after these two have been released from prison, you can imagine Joseph uh, nervously and perhaps even eagerly anticipating some kind of word, something to tell him that his case is being looked at, that someone is, is speaking a word for him. This had to be a God thing, right? Right? I mean, have you ever had an experience in your life that, that things are aligning in such a providential way that you say to somebody around you, this has to be a God thing. 
God has to be doing something here. There's, there's no way that this would have happened in this particular way at this particular lo- time unless God was, was doing something. Or there's no way that I would have met this person at this particular time if God wasn't at work. It's got to be a God thing. But days pass. Then weeks pass. Those weeks turn into months, and those months turn into years. And you know that disappointment, right? When, you, when it seems like God has perfectly aligned things, and you think, oh, I can see what he's doing here, and then he doesn't. And it's almost worse. Because it felt like, oh, I can see what God is at work doing. I know what he's going to do in this situation. I can see how he's going to come through. And so you have hope, only to see that hope not realize. The Bible doesn't tell us what Joseph was feeling during this time. But perhaps this was the low point. Every time Joseph thinks he's hit the bottom, he still hasn't quite reached it yet. And perhaps now in the wake of everything that's gone on, the excitement that, well, perhaps now somebody will finally speak a word for me, and then nothing happens for years. Perhaps Joseph reaches the bottom. If you were in his situation, perhaps you would start coming to terms with the fact that you might spend the rest of your life abandoned in this prison. Perhaps this is a time in his life where Joseph most feels alone. He has been abandoned by his brothers. He has been abandoned by the household that he, that had put him in charge of their entire affairs. He has been abandoned by this cupbearer who has the power to do something on his behalf perhaps but does not do so. And I suspect that if if you and I were in Joseph's place, perhaps you might even start to feel abandoned by God. Because God, I mean, if there was anything you could capitalize on, it would have been that, right? If there was anything that you could do or were going to do to spring me out of this, I mean, the the moment has passed. As I have mentioned numerous times already this morning, many of us here, sitting here in the room this morning, know the pain of being alone. And Joseph's life is proof you don't have to be by yourself to be alone, do you? You can be surrounded by people and still feel profoundly alone. Joseph was surrounded by people and yet felt invisible. We've got people here this morning where you have struggled the entirety of your life with the effects of being abandoned by a parent or by your parents. And that has worked itself out in your relationships for the entirety of your life because you have not been able to escape that feeling of abandonment from so long ago. If 
We've got people here who have worked hard to raise your children. You have done, as far as you could, everything right. And they don't call. And you feel abandoned by them. We've got people here who have been forsaken by a spouse. 23 years of marriage, gone. In a blink of an eye. We've got young people here who go to school week in and week out. You're kind to everyone. You do the best you can to be friendly, to be a light in that place, and still it's like nobody even knows you're alive. Now, I recognize that these are are varying in degree in the way they hurt and the effects that they have, and I know that there may be a hundred different more examples out there, but perhaps that spurs you into thinking about your own experiences of feeling like nobody cares. Some of you walked in here this morning and you say, 59 days, that'd be nice. I feel like I've been trekking across Antarctica solo for 17 years. Joseph explains in chapter 50 and verse 20, as he looks back on the experiences of his life, he's got a perspective that is able to say, out of all the things that have happened, even the things that were intentionally done to me for evil, God meant it for good. And that little word, it, encompasses a lifetime of difficulty and pain. But the Bible says that God actually does intend everything that happens in our lives for good, which does not mean that everything difficult that happens in our lives is good, but that God uses everything, and we do mean everything, for our good. Even the experiences of being alone, forgotten, or abandoned. There are several different words that we could use to apply to Joseph's situation. But the word that I want to use today is a word that shows up on numerous occasions in the Bible, and it is the word forsaken. That word shows up numerous times throughout the Scripture. We've been asking the question, what is the it that God uses for good in Joseph's life? And we've seen in chapter 37 that God uses betrayal for good. We've seen in chapter 38 that God uses our own sinful choices for good. Now I want us to see chapter 40, that God uses the experience of being forsaken for good. How can God use something like that in our lives for good? I'd like to suggest two ways. In the first place, the experience of being forsaken prepares us to receive God's blessings in the future. It prepares us to see God's blessings and experience those blessings in the future. Those 
days turned into weeks and into months and into years. If, if I'm in Joseph's spot, I'm going to conclude, you know, I thought that was a God thing, but I was mistaken. And that would be the wrong conclusion. Because when we see God at work, and we give up because it appears like He isn't, we forget that God is working on a timetable that we are not working with. When I see God doing a God thing, I think the God thing is supposed to be happening right now. Or at least in the very near future. Because that's the way it happens in movies. It's got to happen in an hour and a half or two hours max. But that's often not the way God works. As Joseph lives day in and day out performing mundane duties in this prison of which we know nothing... He is performing daily acts of everyday faithfulness, and it is a God thing because God is actually at work in ways that Joseph could not have dreamed. Joseph would not have believed you if you had come to him and said, it's going to blow your mind. But in a couple years, Pharaoh is going to give you the Egyptian equivalent of his second Rolls Royce, and you're going to be driving around through Egypt with people people bowing down to you. Even though it looked like nothing was going on, even that these difficult experiences were maneuvering Joseph into a place where he would experience God's blessings in a way that he never could have imagined. And then God was doing something even beyond that, because not only did God intend to bless Joseph, but God intended to use Joseph to bless thousands of other people. He was going to use Joseph to keep thousands of people alive. We're getting ahead of ourselves in the story. But... But a lot of you know that's coming, so I haven't just spoiled it for most of you. For those of you who are new to the Bible, I'm sorry. (laughs) The same thing is true for us. As painful as your experiences of being forsaken may have been, God is using that for your good. What you need to hear this morning is that there is a happily ever after coming. Let me be careful in framing that for you. talk about God working everything out for our good, you hold up a situation before me and you say, how and when is is God going to use this for my good? Because I'm going to guess I'm not about to be second in command in Egypt. How is God going to do that? My response is, how should I know? I mean, we just don't know. There may be some good that you haven't be even begun to imagine that comes in your life in ways that you could not imagine. could be that 
the difficulties of this life, what is called this veil of tears, is, is further preparing your heart for glory. I don't know. And I'm not here this morning to get you revved up. I'm not here this morning to give you false hope. I'm not here this morning to tell you that, that, that the sun's just going to come out tomorrow and you're going to feel great. You know, we, we look at Job's life and all the difficulties that Job experiences and he, he loses everything and then he gets a lot of things back. And the Bible never says so. So, so Joseph doesn't even care about all the things that he lost before. There are scars and hurts that, that we experience that aren't going to go away from our loss. But what we can say for certain, from Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. The pain that you have or are experiencing right now is preparing you to receive God's blessing. Because he loves you. Secondly, we're thinking about how God uses the experience of being forsaken for good First prepares us to receive God's blessings in the future, but in the second place, it enables us to experience God's presence in the present. The chapter that we've looked at today, chapter 40, doesn't reiterate this for us, but we saw last week in chapter 39, Genesis took great care to remind us that even in prison, the Lord was with Joseph. You may have underlined those passages in your Bible in verses 2, 3, 21, and 23. Even though Joseph felt great experiences of being abandoned, the Lord was with Joseph. And I can say with absolute certainty, child of God, the Lord is indeed with you. It may feel circumstantially, that he has left your side. But you need to know. You need to be reminded. You need to ask God to help you believe that he is with you. The Psalms, and the authors of the Psalms, wrestle with feelings of being forsaken. But they yield promises like this in Psalm chapter 27 and verse 10. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me. And as painful as it is to be forsaken by a parent or by a spouse or by a child or by a friend, we have this promise from Jesus in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And Christians the trials and difficulties that we experience in life are intended by God to draw us into a greater experience of God. The difficulties that you and I face as we make our way through this life, the abandonment that you have, may have experienced, those feelings of, of loneliness, of being so totally and completely and profoundly alone are meant to be used by God to turn you towards Him. Those feelings of abandonment, as difficult as they may be to deal with in your life, 
are, are graciously turning you to someone who promises he will never leave you or forsake you, who promises that there is a sweetness that comes from God's presence. You see, Joseph's experience of being forsaken points us forward to Jesus. He points us forward to Jesus again and again. And let me tell you something, in your aloneness, Jesus knows what it feels like to be forsaken. The Gospels tell us that Jesus was forsaken by his brothers and sisters. Imagine wrestling with a sibling who's perfect. It's not until after the resurrection that they say, we may have gotten this wrong. He experiences being forsaken as large numbers of the crowds that are following in him. And he's, he's drawing big numbers. But the crowds start to dissipate and fall away because Jesus is failing to do with them what he sometimes fails to do with us. Conform to their expectations. I've got plans for Jesus. For some reason, he's not doing them. Jesus knows what it's like to be forsaken by his own disciples, the 12 people closest to him. One of them betrayed him stuck a knife in his back with a kiss on the cheek. And the others ran. Leaving Jesus to be walked into custody alone. And all of these many experiences of being forsaken lead up to the culmination at the cross where with his last breaths, he cries out, Eli, Eli, Lema, Sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus knows what it feels like to be alone. Your most profound experience of loneliness that I may not be able to empathize with, you need to understand, Jesus knows. And he experienced all those feelings of being forsaken through his life and the feeling of being forsaken by his father on the cross so that you and I could have the promise from God, I'll never leave you and never forsake you, no matter where you've been or what you've done or what you go through. I won't leave. And your own father may not have been able to say that, but your heavenly father promised. So let me then call someone who is lonely here this morning to the foot of the cross. We invite you this morning, if you don't know Christ, to come and kneel as yourself, as it were, before the foot of the cross and just look up at the God-man cries out in anguish from the pain of abandonment so that he could draw lost people like me and lost people like you into a relationship that never can be broken. You can put your faith in Jesus Christ right now. And though all others may have forsaken you, husband, wife, child, friend, father, or mother, Jesus never will. And then he takes all of the stuff, 
all that bad stuff, all the ache, the longing of loneliness, and tells us we can't see it right now. And it might not be tomorrow. And it might not be next week. It might not even be next year. But I promise you, it's going to work out for good. Let's pray. Lord, you're the kind of God who calls the weary, the brokenhearted, forgotten, the abandoned, and the abandoners to yourself to find rest for our souls. Our first prayer this morning is for someone who might be with us that came in here feeling alone. I pray that you would help them to experience the fellowship of the Father, the Heavenly Father this morning. Lord, there are Christian people here who have that ache of abandonment and loneliness in their hearts. I pray that you would give them a fresh trust and awareness of your presence this morning. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, now we get a chance to respond to that truth. Um, and that's truth that's worth responding to, isn't it? Uh, and so maybe the Lord is moving in you right now. And, uh, and you need prayer or you need counsel or you need encouragement. Uh, we're going to have a couple of people who are, are down here at the front in just a minute when we sing. And if you'd like to uh, talk with them, one of them, or pray with one of them, you can do that. Uh, while we sing, uh, we'll be around here afterwards. So uh, we can do the same thing with you after the service. Um, we also respond uh, by giving. The Lord has given us the, uh, the calling and the privilege and the responsibility of, uh, of giving with our finances in response to the way that he gives to us in Christ and in the gospel. Um, so we, we have ways to do that electronically. Um, you can also give uh, with physical check or cash uh, in a little box with our logo on it that's out by the back door you'll see on your way out. And then lastly, and, and most immediately perhaps, we respond by singing. And we're going to sing a couple of songs that uh, let us sing our way back through that sermon. And so we're going to sing looking ahead to eternity, uh, looking to the promise, the certain promise that God's going to make all things new and make all things right. And I don't know if you're like me, but probably some of you are. It's easier for me to believe that sort of like cosmically than it is for myself or to feel that for myself. It's actually easier for, for me to believe God's going to set everything right at the, at the large scale. And it's a little harder for me to see and believe and feel the equally certain reality that God is going to set right the things that feel broken and lost in me and in my life. So we're going to sing that, and then we're going to sing about the present hope of all of these promises of God and the presence of God, which is peace that surpasses all human understanding which is a testimony that says, whatever is going on, whatever my lot, the song says, it is well with my soul. You might not be believing that. You might not be feeling that. So we're going to sing that in faith, asking the Lord to make that true of us. Because it's true ultimately that it's well with our souls because of the things that we've heard and because of the things that we're going we're gonna to sing. So I'm telling you, that along with many other people in this room and many other people up on this stage, you can sing that in faith even though you're reaching for it and you're fighting to believe it. Amen? So let's stand and let's sing. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark will 
to stop the lie from getting through. We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do. Is all creation groaning? It is. Is a new creation coming? It is. Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? It is. Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy of this? He is. Does the Father truly love us? He does. Does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those He loves? He does. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? He does. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. From every people and tribe, Every nation and tongue, he has made us a kingdom and priest to God to reign with the Son. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Is he worthy of this? He is, he is, he is worthy, he is worthy, he is, he is. He is. He is. my 
our God good? So we're sent out uh, to live in light of that and to live in the, uh, the hope and joy and rest of these truths. Amen. So as we go in those realities and in that hope, I just want to uh, tell you about a couple of things and a couple of ways that we can uh, further pursue uh, together as a church family and in unity. Um, the sort of hope and the sort of peace uh, and the sort of missionally aimed life um, that the Lord calls us to in response to this. So one of the ways that we can seek this is, is by um, being in community, right? The Lord, one of the ways that the Lord ingrains this kind of gospel hope into us is by being with other Christians who are experiencing it and pursuing it too and who can help call us to it. Sometimes we need to help call them to it. Um, the primary way that we're trying to do that at our church is through community groups. It's not the only way that that happens, but it's a way for us to, uh, to sort of create a system that helps us to pursue that kind of community. And our new community group semester is starting up in two weeks. And so there's still time for you to get registered if you'd like to connect to a group. 
If you have questions, if you don't know what community groups are all about, maybe you've had a bad experience someplace, some other place certainly, I'm sure, not here. No. Maybe you've, but maybe you've had a difficult experience in a community group. Those things happen too. Um, and we'd love to talk to you about that. We'd love to, to um, help you get connected if you're interested or just answer some questions. So you can stop by the connection desk after the service. They can register you. They can uh, get some questions answered or they can point you in the direction of someone else who could answer questions um, if you have them. Uh, and then, guys, uh, we mentioned last week a uh, men's activity coming up on July, Saturday, July 29th. Today's actually the, actually the last day that you can get registered for that. We need to give a final count to uh, the people who are catering food tomorrow. So uh, if you're thinking about that, uh, now is the time to make a decision. And the decision is absolutely to register and come. Um, but you can do the same thing. Stop by the, the uh, connection desk, and they can get you any information. They can get you registered as well. And then lastly, the ladies are having a game night here tomorrow evening, and we need a little bit of help to uh, get the atrium set up for that. So if you're able to help, just roll out some chairs and tables. That'll go very quickly. Um, but they're looking for a few, uh, few willing and able hands to help with that right after the service. Um, but I want to send us out with a benediction uh, from the book of Romans that reminds us of the kind of hope that we have as Christians. And it calls us to believe it and to live in light of it. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Amen. Go in the grace of the Lord.